The following video is brought to you in part by the amazing Patreon producers you see before you. If you'd like to show your support, you can do so at patreon.com slash 616 entertainment. Your support means the world to me, and I love you so much. Now let's get to it. What's up, Dan Dans? My name is Ian. I'm here to welcome you to another episode of Mortal Kombat Monday. Now, you may or may not know, I've been reading the Mortal Kombat novel by Jeff Rovin here on this channel, periodically throughout the weeks, and uh, it's terrible. It's fucking awful. But today, it's time for another installment of reading the Mortal Kombat novel. <sighs> Usually I do four chapters. This week I'm going to do nine through 14. That's five chapters. Because we got to get this fucking show on the road. You know what I'm saying? This book is not good. If you haven't listened to the other parts yet, don't expect it to be good. But maybe you can laugh at my frustration because I can't, I just, I can't do it anymore. Let's get to it. All right, Dan Dans. First of all, full disclosure, right up front, once again, I haven't touched this book in months. <laughs> Whenever the last video went up, I probably recorded that two weeks before you actually saw it. And now it's been like six more weeks, so I don't remember what any of my voices sounded like. I'm just going to wing it. You ready? <laughs> We're starting off with chapter nine here. On the morning of every Mortal Kombat, Kung Lao had a ritual. The champion would rise well before the sun, pray until after the dawn, and then strip to the waist and slowly drag a thorn branch over his body, a spring torn from the shrubs in the foothills of Mount Ikufube. Fuck, I did it again. Ifukube. I'm never going to get that right first try, am I? First of all, and Kung Lao's fucked up. He's dragging this thorn branch over himself. <laughs> The thin, superficial wounds did not weaken him, but Kung Lao knew that if his flesh were sore, he would react that much quicker to protect himself from being hurt. Adorned with this webwork of blood, Kung Lao ate none of the fruit and meat that had been left out at his door, drank none of the nectars from their silver goblets. As he sat on the terrace of his spacious champion's rooms on the bottom floor and, comp and composed his spirit as cool sea winds washed over him, he ate two humble rice cakes that had been made for him by the Order of Light Monks of Ifukube. I got it right that time. It was good to feel the claws of hunger scratching at him during the tournament. It helped keep him alert, right there, living in the moment. When he was finished eating, he continued to sit there, contemplating the deity in whose name he fought. And, on this day... Wondering about the awful presence he had felt in the rooms where somewhere above him had he... What the fuck? <laughs> Take two on that one. And on this day, wondering about the awful presence he had felt in the rooms somewhere above him where he'd arrived and continued to fe feel in his steps during his deepest prayers even now. <sighs> I hate to do this already, but we're, we have to deconstruct the sentence because they're losing me. It's so fucking long. What's your name? Jeff Rovin, you fucker. Let's take this slow. And on this day, wondering about the awful presence he had felt in the rooms somewhere above him when he'd arrived, and continued to feel in his sleep during his deepest prayers and even now. Okay, if I take it super slow, I got it. We are not off to a good start. <laughs> And then, when the huge bell sounded in the courtyard outside the palace, the site of the initial bouts, he went to the tournament dressed in his slippers, loose skirt, leggings, and the mien of a champion. The mien? The mien? M-I-E-N? I don't know what that word is. Only around his neck and on his chest did Kung Lao feel naked. So that right there, that was a page and a half. That was chapter nine. Why bother making that a chapter? I don't know. But let's kick off chapter ten. The courtyard of the palace was a giant oblong... No, there's not a comma after giant. It's just giant oblong. I hate this book. I hate this book to death. We're doing five chapters this time instead of the normal four. Five, right? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four... I don't know if I said five or six. Uh, who cares? The court... <laughs> The courtyard of the palace was a giant oblong made of stone with a huge black ivory inlay of Shang's dragon. It was said that the ivory was not dyed but had, but had been made from the horns of the dragon itself, a beast that resided in some other realm. The stone stands reached 200 hands high and surrounded the courtyard on three sides. 
They quickly filled the dozens of participants who waited their turn to fight, and with the mysterious retainers of Shang Tsung, who never raised their hoods to watch and who never showed any emotion or hostility, even when their own master was defeated. These sentences are so long that I lose what they're talking about halfway through. Am I just dumb? Feel free to let me know in the comments. Stone dragons lined the wall behind the uppermost row of the grandstand, their mouths spouting fire at night so that the tournament could continue in the dark. Yellow-orange banners bearing the silhouette of the black dragon hung simply lie... <sighs> <laughs> This is a mistake. This is a mistake. <laughs> I shouldn't be reading this book. I shouldn't be reading this book. <sighs> oh, we got it. We got it. We got it. Oh, here we go. Where, where the fuck did I leave off? Yellow-orange banners bearing the silhouette of the black dragon hung limply from poles stuck in the back of each stone figure. Behind the dragons on the long western wall were the flared red columns of the temple, with its roof of thick green tiles and a repetition of the dragon motif in black tile. On the fourth side of the courtyard, above the great gate through which the combatants passed, was Shang's throne. The chair was made of iron, forged in the shape of human bones, cushioned with the mystically preserved blubber of a whale and covered with a thick throw of fur from one of the sacred pandas, fur only one such as Shang would dare to take. A canopy of unknown material, supported by a column constructed of shark teeth, protected him from the hazy sun. Some said the material was human flesh, but few thought that even the vicious Shang Tsung could be capable of such a vile and corrupt display. Kung Lao was not one of the few. Damn, so Shang Tsung got his shit all decked out here. <laughs> That's some nasty shit. The champion did not arrive with the ceremony, though it was to his request, nor did he sit in the special seat that was reserved for him in the center of the lowest row of the grandstand. He preferred to come and go as any participant. He believed that honor had to be won anew each year, carried over from the previous tournament. Not carried over from the previous tournament, sorry. However, he was not required to fight until all but the three best martial artists had been eliminated. The early contests were always interesting and exciting, as an eclectic mix of veterans and newcomers fought in a series of eliminations in three separate areas. Both losers and victors returned to the stands when they were through, the former to watch and learn, the latter to wait the next series of bouts. By nightfall, the trio who would fight in the final rounds had been selected. Kung Lao was required to battle each one in turn. Despite their prowess and the fact that two of the three were newcomers to Mortal Kombat, Kung Lao had made quick work of all of them. One of them, a brawny thing who called himself Ufila, the Ostrogoth, did not use the martial arts but attacked violently with a spiked club and shield and tired quickly. Another, Kung Lao's old adversary Mahada, a Marian who recited the Vedic Hymn of the Creation, what? As he fought, put up a noble struggle but lost several teeth during the match, and with them his ability to utter the hymn and his confidence. The third foe, a Roman wrestler named Toysaurus, gave Kung Lao some trouble when he pinned him to the ground, but the pain of the champion's self-inflicted lacerations was the added boost he needed to throw the challenger off. In the past, Kung Lao ruminated, the power of the amulet would have ensured that he not find himself in that position in the first place. So if you recall, the last time that I read this goddamn book, <laughs> there was a chapter where we found out that Kung Lao usually went into the Mortal Kombat tournament with an amulet that gave him special powers. He decided to leave it behind this time. So that's why he got pinned and fucked up. That's what they're referring to here. All through the long day, Kung Lao had continued to feel the presence of something formidable, though as yet he had neither seen, heard, nor smelled anyone that could have been the cause of his unrest. After beating Toysaurus with a shoulder throw that knocked the air from his lungs and the fight from his limbs, Kung Lao turned to his host, bowed, spread his legs, cocked his arms at his side, and waited. A long moment later, Shang Tsung smiled, the first time Kung Lao had ever seen him do so. Okay, so now we have to do the Shang Tsung voice, and I don't remember what it is. So I'm going to copy the bullshit version from Mortal Kombat 9, 
which if you watched last week's episode, was part two of me playing the Mortal Kombat 9 story. And the guy who did Shang Tsung's voice is kind of terrible, but we're just going to copy that. Your victory is impressive, said the host. The more so because we noticed that for the first time you participated without the aid of magic. And how did I do the Kung Lao voice? <laughs> I don't remember. Religion is not magic, Kung Lao said. A debatable point for some other time, Shang Tsung said as he continued to smile. What has earned our attention and respect is that you have won without your amulet. The eyes of the prematurely aged wizard narrowed, and his bushy white brows dripped in the center. One, to this point, there was one more battle yet to fight. As you can see, Kung Lao said, I await you. Shang Tsung looked at him for a moment, then crooked a finger at a hooded figure who stood to his right. Fan, he said. The figure reached into his robe and removed a folding fan made of rice paper. He moved it from side to side, through his, though his motions were slow and unforceful. Banners on the distant wall stirred. Shang Tsung's smile broadened. The humorless, unnatural grin on that skull-like face made Kung Lao uneasy. Did you know, Shang Tsung asked, that I decided not to fight this year? I am truly sorry to hear that. I believe you, Shang Tsung replied. Do you wish to come forward and accept the benediction of victory? Kung Lao remained locked in his combative pose. Uh, it's hard to tell whether this is Kung Lao or Shang Tsung. Okay, I think it's Kung Lao. <laughs> you know that goes against the rules of Mortal Kombat. There must be a battle between the champion and his host. Or, if the host is debilitated, between the champion and the host's champion. Of course, Shang Tsung said. Otherwise, the winner does not win the ultimate prize, the precious gift of not aging until the next Mortal Kombat. Kung Lao shook his head. That isn't why I fight, and I submit that that isn't why most of these people are here. They fight for honor, no other reward. He felt the presence more strongly than ever now. Whatever was going to happen, whoever was going to appear would do so soon. You're probably right, Shang Tsung admitted. The smile wavered and collapsed. What good is anything in life if we do not have honor, if we do not control our own souls? Shang Tsung waved away his servant, then continued to stare at Kung Lao as he clapped his hands once. There was a groaning outside the courtyard, as, a cart of, as of a cart being wheeled beneath a staggering weight, and then a clanking and rattling as though chains were being pulled and then dropped. These were followed by the thunderous sounds of footfalls in the dark beyond the dragon flames. I have decided, Shang Tsung said, to, uh, take the year off. I'm no longer young, Kung Lao, and felt it would be best for this year to at least let someone else fight on my behalf. If you guys remember, the first time I read this book, this is where the book started. We're ten chapters in now, and we're finally getting back to where we started. The thundering grew louder as a great and hulking shape began to emerge from the darkness. It was vaguely human in form, but stood over eight feet tall and had, it appeared, not the usual complement of limbs, but more. As the being approached, Kung Lao felt the sinister presence grow stronger and stronger, as though a great evil had been dropped in their midst. More evil than Shang Tsung, who, after all, was still human. This new thing was not. It bent its titanic head to get under the gate, then stood in the he uh, shit, and then stood in the firelit courtyard. Its red eyes scanned the stands. There were cries of fear from many of the great heroes who had gathered here, and more when the bronze-skinned entity roared, the uppermost of its four powerfully muscled arms thumping its great chest, the lower two reaching impatiently toward Kung Lao. The muscles of each of the four forearms strained against the iron wristbands by which it had been kept manacled, and every one of the three thick, fing three thick fingers on the lower hands curled, aching for combat. The newcomer's sharp ears twitched with obvious delight as it listened to the fear of the beaten warriors. When Kung Lao didn't flinch, the creature shook its great head defiantly. Its long, black queue of hair swung pendulously behind it, and its nearly lipless mouth opened wide, exposing white teeth with two sharp fangs glistening with spittle. The giant shifted impatiently from leg to leg, 
It's clearly defined abdominal muscles straining behind a red leather belt with a yin and yang symbol on the buckle. It's elephantine leg muscles bulging beneath the blue loincloth it wore. Can we pause real quick? The painting of the picture of Goro here is really good. So Jeff Rovin, where the fuck was this throughout the first 10 chapters? There have been flashes of brilliance throughout this book. And this is one of them right now. I think they're doing a really good job of describing who and what Goro is. But goddamn, have we been through some fucking stinker paragraphs so far. <laughs> but this is pretty good. I gotta give credit where credit's due. The monster. <clears throat> wow. I should have brought a drink in here so I can keep my throat wet, but I didn't. Let's see if we can get through the whole thing without one. The monster, for such was the only word that came to Kung Lao's mind, had two powerful claws on each foot, and the one dew claw behind, and all six of them scratched angrily on the floor of the arena. The gray leggings it wore on its shins seemed to ready uh, The gray leggings it wore on its shins seemed about ready to pop from the pressure of the Sino beneath them. Shang Tsung's eyes gleamed wickedly. Kung Lao, I would like to introduce you to my champion. The son of King Borb Borbak. Borbak? The son of King Borbak and Queen Mai. <sighs> Take three on this one. You ready? The son of King Borbak and Queen... What is Queen? What the fuck? I'm saying King and Queen. What the fuck is a Queen? <laughs> Take four. The son of King Borbak and Queen Mai, the Prince of Kwatan, and the ruler supreme of the armies of the kingdoms of Shokan. Kung Lao watched as the brute's evil mouth tightened with rage. However, Shang Tsung said, if you can still speak hereafter, you are free to call him by his given name, Goro. We're into chapter 11, guys. If... A thousand ifs flitted through Kung Lao's brain as the behemoth began to move. If he had been con confident enough to have brought his amulet, he would have stood a better chance against the challenger. If he had accepted the championship without the benediction, as the rules did permit, his honor and perhaps his life would not be at stake. If he had insisted on fighting Shang Tsung, as was his right, then surely he would have won. For the one-time martial arts master had grown frail. If. With a roar that shook the flames from the stone dragon's mouths and the thumping footfalls that rattled the courtyard itself, Goro charged his foe. As befitted a warrior priest of the Order of Light and a champion of mortal combat, Kung Lao did not stand and wait to receive his attack. He ran at his overbearing challenger. With a piercing cry that came from somewhere deep inside. The shout was so startling, so feral, that even Goro's brutish face registered surprise. But it didn't stop him. The two warriors continued to thunder toward each other. As, mu uh, as much dragon in appearance as human, the beast was not as fleet as Kung Lao, and the champion felt that would only fuck. And the champion felt that would be his only advantage. The instant Goro was in reach, Kung Lao turned, dropped his hands into one knee and stretched the other leg behind him in an effort to sweep kick the giant off his feet. Instead, Goro bent and met the attack with his lower right forearm. His stiff limb blocked the kick while his other three arms reached for his quarry. Taking a quick look behind him, Kung Lao caught one of Goro's hands with a crouch kick, and he tucked himself into a ball and did, and did a backward somersault between the giant's wide legs. Rising quickly behind him, the champion executed a high jump kick and planted it in the small of Goro's back. The crowd cheered as the titan's arms flew up and his head flew back. But the blows seemed to simply enrage the leviathan rather than harm him. As Kung Lao jumped to try and land a second quick kick, Goro planted himself firmly on one stout leg and kicked the other behind him, catching Kung Lao on the way up. The kick knocked the champion backward, though he was able to roll with it, somersault again, and land crouching on the stones of the courtyard. Turning, Goro charged again. This time, Kung Lao waited, then dropped flat on his back, elbows bent up, palms flat on the grounds beside him. Pushing off with his hands, I'll take that again because that sounded weird. <laughs> Pushing off with his hands, he kicked out with his stiff legs, driving them hard into Goro's abdomen. 
A small puff of breath escaped the prince's gash of a mouth. But Kung Lao knew, from the massive muscle he'd struck, that Goro hadn't been hurt by the blow. Worse, before he was able to retract his legs, four massive hands closed around them from either side. Lifting Kung Lao into the air, his back toward him, Goro kicked the martial arts master hard between the shoulder blades. The blow knocked the wind out of him, and Kung Lao couldn't take another. When Goro kicked out again, Kung Lao felt the rush of air and quickly arched upward, grabbed his own ankles, and, still hanging from Goro's hands, pulled himself up and over the outstretched foot. Seizing Goro's momentary... Take two. <laughs> Seizing Goro's momentary imbalance, Kung Lao yanked his feet downward, freeing himself from the giant's grip and coming down hard on the prince's still extended leg. That'll fuck you up real quick. If you guys have, you, if you guys have never hyperextended your knee, let me tell you something, man. That shit hurts. Goro howled with pain, the crowd roared with approval, and Kung Lao landed. The Order of Light priests simultaneously used the leg as a springboard to jump and away from Goro. He landed beside his foe, a bit, a bit, bl uh, this is tripping me up. He landed beside his foe, a bit battered, but with his arms crossed in front of him, still ready to fight. The prince turned toward him, but Kung Lao was quick and drove the bottom of his foot into Goro's right knee. The giant buckled, but again, there was the advantage of those four powerful arms and extraordinary reach. Even as he fell, Goro was able to grab Kung Lao's arms. Goro drew the champion down with him, leaving Kung Lao no offensive maneuver other than to throw a scissor lock around Goro's neck. The outworld denizen released Kung Lao's arms and easily pried his legs away, and kept pulling as though his victim were a dried tree branch. Tree branch. I really should have bought some drink in here. <laughs> Shrieking pain shot through Kung Lao's inner thighs and managed to get his arms under himself. He pulled off with one, twisting himself around like a corkscrew and managing to worm himself through Goro's grasp. Hold on one second. If Goro grabbed you by the ankles and started pulling your legs in opposite directions, looking to split you like a fucking wishbone... I think I'd rather die. I know I would rather die. At that point, I'd be like, dude, big man, just fucking give me the great Kali chop on my fucking brain and just end it, will ya? The angry giant pounded the ground with all four fists in succession, then reached for Kung Lao, who by this time was struggling to stand on legs that felt as sturdy as marsh reeds. But stand he did, and when Goro came at him, head bowed and charging like an animal, Kung Lao backflipped away then stopped while he was still standing on his hands and suddenly flung himself feet first toward the titan. His feet landed on the back of Goro's neck, driving his chin into the hard tile of the dragon symbol and drawing greenish blood. Ooh, Goro's got green blood here. Goro stood, the red eyes coal hot and wide, and Kung Lao knew that hurting his foe without being able to deliver a final blow had been a mistake. Swinging his head around furiously, Goro whipped his cue around so fast that, if it connected, Kung Lao suspected would break his back. Jumping a... Had a burp there. <laughs> what are you going to do, man? Snuck up on me. Jumping back repeatedly, Kung Lao found himself backed against the lowest row of seats on the southern side of the arena. While the onlookers scurried and Kung Lao tried to avoid the whirling hair... Goro drove all four fists ahead of him. Three connected with the stone, cracking it. The fourth caught Kung Lao in the left shoulder while he jumped to the side to avoid the other three. The champion moaned as the hard flesh and harder bone pinned him to the stone. Holding Kung Lao there, Goro brought his other three fists around and pounded him mercilessly. Though Kung Lao was able to move his face out of the way of some of the blows, and was able to deflect others with the strong side of his hand, many found their targets on his torso, abdomen, legs, and shoulders. Aching everywhere, Kung Lao found his reflexes slowing, his senses numb. More blows landed, but he only felt the thudding, not the pain. Through blood-soaked eyes, he saw Shang Tsung standing in the front standing in the front of his throne, watching his servant pummel Kung Lao, his own hands balled into fists, as he apparently wished that it were he instead of Goro, who was ministering the punishment. Kill him! Kung Lao heard someone shout. Was it Shang Tsung? 
His heart, he heard. Give me his heart! Suddenly the pummeling stopped. Kung Lao staggered forward and with superhuman effort managed to keep his feet underneath him. Don't be a dog, he told himself. He stood there, his body weaving above the knees, his arms raised in a futile defense, his bleary eyes watching, throbbing ears listening for Goro to move in again. Kung Lao could only vaguely make out the giant bronze shape in front of him, and the red eyes were lost entirely in the blood and sweat through which Kung Lao gazed. He saw Goro's mouth wide open, saw the blurry mass of cruel white teeth. White on gold, Kung Lao thought as Goro's shape shifted and oozed due to the perspiration and the blood in Kung Lao's eyes, just like the amulet. The strange, enduring duality of all things that lost... Take two. The strange, enduring duality of all things was lost. The last... Why am I... I'm making up words here. I'm using words that aren't here. Take three. The strange, enduring duality of all was... <laughs> At this point, I can't help but laugh because I'm just fucking dumb. The strange, enduring duality of all things was the last thought on Kung Lao's mind as the three Goro's mighty hands grabbed him, and then the fourth came toward his chest, fingers outstretched, ready to claim their prize. Not the benediction from Shang Tsung, but the great and noble heart of the High Priest of the Order of Light. Nearly 600 miles away, in a hut by a construction bridge that was rapidly nearing completion, a strong young man watched as his wife gave birth to their baby son. Covered with blood, the boy wailed when the elderly midwife smacked him on the bottom and scooped the remnants of afterbirth from his mouth. She laid the baby in a soft blanket and folded it around him, then handed the child to his mother. The elderly woman smiled at the young woman and then scowled at the baby's father. You should be smacked yourself for having brought her here in this condition, she said. Chan Lao smiled. I? Smacked? It was my wife who insisted on coming with me while I work on this bridge. I asked her to stay behind. Asked, huffed the old woman. What is it with young women today? We wagged a finger at Chan Lao. Shit, she wagged a finger at Chan Lao. You should tell her what to do and she should do as she is told. Uh, I'm losing, there's so many characters here, they're losing me. That is not the way in our family, Mi Lao said softly. She kissed her baby on his damp ear and brushed back his head of black hair. We have always respected one another equally. Her eyes found those of her husband. Didn't you always say your elder brother treated you as his equal, despite the difference in your years? In work as well as play, Chan Lao remarked, there was none fairer than Kung Lao. As the midwife finished cleaning up, the young man walked over to his wife. He embraced me and their son. Me smiled. I was right and you were wrong, she said. We have a son, Chan. My father is still alive. Can we name him Wing Lao after your father? Chan looked down at the new life he had helped to create. Despite the excitement at seeing his firstborn cuddled in the arms of his wife, Chan felt a sudden, inexplicable chill. Would you mind, me, if we save that name for our second son? Second, me laughed. You must always be the engineer, looking ahead to the next project. It isn't that, Chan said, but I suddenly feel compelled for some reason to name the boy after my brother. Mi's features darkened, but you haven't seen him for 15 years. He ran off to find, what was it again? A god, Chan said dryly. At least, that's what my poor aunt said. She never recovered from losing him and died a year after his departure. A god, Mi said. You want to name your son after someone who was mad enough to go looking for a god? Chan nodded. Yes, I don't know why, but I do. If that is what you want, she said, then I agree. We will name our son Kung Lao. When she spoke the name, the baby quieted. And somewhere in the distance, thunder rolled. So we're about to start, that was the close of what, chapter, that was the close of chapter 11. So now I'm looking at this page here that just says part two, the, the Tianjin district, China, the present. So I think we are finally about to jump forward in time, maybe to where the fucking movie was. <laughs> I have no idea. 
But what what did we just learn? If you've been with us since the first time we started reading this book, who's we? I'm the one reading the fucking book. Why well, I got a mouse in my pocket? What the fuck am I talking about? It's too late at night for me to be doing this. <laughs> so you're talking about we. Um, we found out way back. There's we again. That <laughs> Kung Lao left his his little hut in the town where he grew up to find a god and whatnot. And his aunt was there, and she was the one who raised him and all this shit. And he always said that he was going to try and find his way back to her. And uh, she didn't want him to go. She really did not want him to go. And he went anyway. And now he just died at the hands of Goro, due to his foolishness of not bringing the amulet. And she died a year after he left. So when Kung Lao had died, she had been dead for over a decade. That is really fucking sad. We're about to start part two of this book, which is uh, opening with chapter 12. It was one of the most idiotic stories Kano had ever heard. Hey, we did jump forward. Maybe that's why the damn thing made no sense, and why after another long day of walking, after four long days of walking, they were lost in a place so remote it made nowhere look like somewhere. <laughs> Mercenary, extortionist, bully for hire, and member of the dreaded Black Dragon Gang, the Japanese-born American shook his head as shook his head as he and his small band of hired thugs made their way through the dark woods and thick underbrush in a chilly, mountainous region of China. Woods, he was sure, that nothing with two legs had crossed since Confucius was in diapers. Especially not the loon who'd given him his given him this map when he hired Kano. Uh so they said that Kano is a Japanese-born American. But fuck that. We're going with Australian Kano. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's just the Kano that I prefer. This is the Kano that we've always known. It's the Kano we've always known and loved. A map drawn by a baby. Please. Maybe it was dictated by a dog who heard about it from a pigeon. It was stupid, all right. But then Kano had heard some peaches... During some peaches? During his 35 years, 30 of which had been devoted to crime. As his team grumbled behind him, he entertained himself by thinking back to some of the stories. Like the time he'd been sent to collect some overdue loans from a macho TV star who'd fallen on hard times. The prop department took my money and... Uh... Okay, so this isn't Kano. <laughs> The prop department took my money instead of the fake money we were using in the scene, the actor had said as Kano held him by the lapels of his jacket. Just give me till tomorrow, I'll have it. Kano gave him three seconds to fall on more than hard times as he dropped him from the top of the cold water canyon onto a roof about 200 feet below. Holy shit. 200 feet, that motherfucker splattered like a cherry tomato. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, the hero-sized... The hero-sized dude landed in such a way that the house of... <sighs> I'm not blaming the sentence on me not being able to read it. I think I'm reading really fast. By my standards, at least. But it's still frustrating. The hero-sized dude landed in such a way that the house, one of those, one of those stilt jobbers, fell down the, to... <laughs> I'm having a stroke. Guys, I have a, I have, there's a bug in my brain for sure. It's eating away the back of my eyes and that's why I can't read. We're going to take this one more time and if I don't get it, tough shit. The hero-sized dude landed in such a way that the house, one of those stilt jobbers, fell down the rest of the cliff, swallowing the actor in a big cloud of debris and smoke. We did it! We got the sentence out. The next day, the papers were all full of actor brings down the house and star dies, hairpiece survives. Then there was the political candidate who, who borrowed a bundle to get elected. When Kano came to collect, the lady said Kano's employer would have to wait. She'd spent it on a voodoo priestess to ensure prosperity for her district. Kano let her live because she was a lady, but he took the James McNeil Whistler painting that, he, that hung in her office. His boss liked the portrait of somebody's dog, Cerberus, and everyone was happy. Except the lady, who was accused of stealing and got booted out of the office. Funny thing was, her district ended up real prosperous. But this story, 
This one took the Nut Burger of the Year award. What the fuck is a Nut Burger? Does anyone know what a Nut Burger is? Is it something from somewhere else? <laughs> and me being a stupid American, I just don't know. If you know what a Nut Burger is, leave a comment. 1,500 years ago, a baby who can barely say two words sticks his finger in a bowl of ink his father's using to draw a dam or whatever the hell this thing under the map is. What the fuck? What is that sentence? 1,500 years ago, a baby who can barely say two words sticks his finger in a bowl of ink his father's using to draw a dam or whatever the hell this thing under the map is. I don't think that's a full sentence. So 15 years ago that happens, what? Then what? We've got the start of a sentence. <sighs> now I'm getting pissed off. The kid draws away, and when the father returns from going to the bathroom or whatever he was off doing, he sees the map all finished on this very piece of goat skin. And then it really got weird. The father was convinced the map was dictated to the baby by a dead guy, and the whole family goes off searching for whatever was marked with the little fingerprint high up on this stinking mountain. No one knows what happened to them, or how the map got into the hands of the guy who hired Kano. But the old dude, Shang Tsung, paid him two million American up front. So who was he to say, nah, your story's right out of the X-Files. Kano scowled as one of the four men and one woman behind him began complaining that he'd stepped in some kind of goat patty. Hey, Kano said, turning his grizzled face toward the man. Cut it out! I hate to hit What is that? I hate to hear yammering when I'm thinking. <laughs> Lock your thinking is doing us any good, the short-haired, long young man shot back. Kano's muscles tensed beneath his windbreaker. What do you mean by that? I mean, chief, said Moriarty. Could we be more lost than we are? Is he fuck? What is he, Chandler? Could we be more lost? <laughs> The sentence was not quite out of the man's mouth when Kano spun, with a cry, swung a roundhouse kick at his jaw. Moriarty barely avoided it by arching back, his arms pinwheeling as he tried desperately to keep his balance on the sharply inclined slope. Kano landed and simply glared at him as he shrugged, as he struggled, sorry. The boss's left eye, the normal brown one, was angry, but his right eye, the infrared vision artificial eye that was held in place by a metal faceplate, glowed with fury. One of Moriarty's companions, Michael Schneider, finally reached out a hairy paw, grabbed him by the front of his sweaty and food-stained covered Jet Li sweatshirt, and pulled him back. Thanks, Schneider, Moriarty said, glancing back at the drop. Had he fallen, he would have slid about 200 yards out of the woods and then dropped off a cliff into the river below. Don't mention it, said the bespectacled Schneider, balding save for a short gray ponytail. Just remember, you owe me one is all. I won't forget, Moriarty said, unlike some jokers, I know the lay of the land. Kano was still giving his man the hot eye. His hands were tight fists, and even his brown buzz cut and two-day-old stubble seemed to bristle. If that was meant to be a parting dig, Kano said, I'll spit on it. And next time you try and tell me what to do, Moriarty, I'll knock your flathead into Columbus Day. You got it? Yeah, sure, Moriarty mumbled. The M44 carbine had slipped from his shoulder to his elbow. After hitching it back and checking the sterling MK4 submachine gun slung around the other, he glowered back at Kano. Glowered? Glowered? But you didn't have to do that, you freaking cyclops. I wasn't lying. We are lost, ain't we? You bet, Kano agreed. But it's this crummy map's fault, not mine. I didn't see anybody here, Beef, when I said, we come this way. You all looked at the rag. He shook the map. It didn't make sense to any of you either. And no, bonehead, I don't need to take a swipe at you. I did it because I wanted to. I like seeing you do your little aerobic... <laughs> I like seeing you do your little aerobics thing. Yeah, Moriarty said. He took a few steps forward and looking into Kano's human eye. <laughs> well, we may be Black Dragon brothers and all, but if you try putting your foot on me again, you better make it count. Otherwise, I'm coming at you. Do you like my terrible accents? I'm just trying to add flavor. Diversity, you know what I'm saying? Are you tough guy? Kano yelled. He stuffed the map into the belt of his jeans. Come at me then. 
Hands or blades, whatever you want. Let's see if you're black dragon enough to take on your leader. Before Moriarty had a chance to move, the red-eyed killer threw a high, savage air kick to the right shoulder, well aware that Moriarty was a lefty and not wanting to hurt his trigger hand. This place was so far from any kind of civilization that Kano figured he'd have to find a yeti to replace Moriarty. Unlike the earlier kick, this one caught Moriarty, who hit the ground and slid down the slope for several yards on his backpack. You stinking son of a lass! He snarled and scrambling to try and reach the MK4 that was beneath him. MK4, that's funny. Don't! Kano yelled as he leapt down the slope and landed, with his leg bent at the knee, his toe pointed under the mercenary's jaw. Not unless you want me practicing field goals with your noggin. Kano felt a prick against the back of his neck. If you try, a woman's voice said, we'll have the kickoff with your head. Kano rolled his eyes toward Gilda's stall, the statuesque, blonde-haired ex-ballet dancer from the U.S. who had the tip of her nine-inch hunting knife pressed to his flesh. He had heard from the man who recommended her for the job that she could deliver on her promise. The guy said he'd seen her once decapitate an enemy with a single stroke of this very same blade and kick his still bleeding head a remarkable 70 yards. 70 yards? That's longer than any NFL field goal kick ever. Just throwing that out there, it's ridiculous. Back off, Gilly, Kano said warily. This ain't your business. You're right, she said, her voice firm, her large brown eyes disapproving. But finding that amulet, getting you to the island, and collecting the payoff is my business. And you and your playmate are holding up the works. I'm defending my honor, Gilda snorted. Your honor's in the same file with your good looks and your PhD brain. The one marked wishful thinking. Watch it, ladykins. Now you're messing with my honor. Ooh, she cooed. How dare I? So why don't you exul exculpate exculpate? <laughs> so why don't you exculpate it? Or better yet, why don't you try spelling exculpate? Damn, bitch got me. <laughs> I've never heard that word before. She <laughs> She turned the blade so it rested lengthwise against the nape of his neck, then leaned closer until her full lips were right beside his ear. He could feel her breath hot on his flesh as she said, Admit it, you big bad boy. You just like to fight. Yeah, he hissed. I like to fight. His brows lowered sternly, narrowing the glow from the artificial eye. The mixture of natural light and infrared light pouring into his brain made him feel like a tiger man, and his claws itched to lash out. I like it a lot. Then take some advice, Gilda whispered. Ah, oh, fuck. Then take some advice. There we go. Gilda whispered, her lips nearer to his ear now, the knife moving along his jaw and around his throat. Do it on your own time, when we're not working. Remember, Kano, ladies don't like guys who aren't gentlemen and professionals. Kano swallowed hard, felt the edge of the knife pressing against his Adam's apple. He looked down at Moriarty, the metal tip of Kano's boot still pointed at the soft flesh under the thug's chin. All right, he said, reluctantly putting his foot down. Get up, custard brain. Kano turned away, and after offering the fallen man her hand and helping him up, Gilda rejoined the group. Gilly, Kano called after her. She stopped and turned her head back halfway. Her sleek green tights glistened in the setting sun, a dramatic contrast to her weather-beaten leather flight jacket. Don't you think that just because you're a lady... I okay, take two, I fucked that up. Don't think that just because you're a lady, I won't take you on, Kano warned. You pulled a knife on me, and I won't forget that. Good, Gilda said, and continued walking. That means I won't have to do it again. Smart mouth huss, Kano thought. A determined... I just spit all over this book. <laughs> determined to teach her a lesson, though not here, and not now. He already had Moriarty and Schneider ready to turn on him, and he didn't want to press his luck. Senny and Wu might get it in their thick heads to do the math and throw in with them to take the lion's share cut. Pulling the mat from his belt can uh, <laughs> I just mixed Kano and continue into one word. Pulling the mat from his belt, Kano continued up the slope, wondering how he had gotten himself into this situation. Controlling members of the deadly Black Dragon Gang was difficult enough under normal circumstances, but keeping on top of this mix of Black Dragons and Melon Mines 
this was nearly impossible. The most reliable of the Asia-based members of the gang hadn't wanted to join Kano, feeling that the story was probably a bunch of hooey, and that not only would he never find the amulet, but he probably wouldn't live to collect the dough that Shang Tsung had promised on delivery of the gem. Of course, none of them knew that the amount was 3 million bucks, or that they might have thought differently. Let's take that again. Of course, none of them thought that the amount was 3 million bucks, or they might have thought differently. But Kano would believe Shang Tsung's emissary, the giant who had come to him at his apartment in Hong Kong. What? <sighs> take two. We're not going to get mad this time, man. We're, we're, we're really... I feel like we're doing okay. We are coexisting with the book. It's not It's not bad. It's not as bad this time. I feel like our boy Jeff Roven is hitting his stride a little bit. I'll give him that. But Kano had believed Shang Tsung's emissary, the giant who had come to him at his apartment in Hong Kong. Not even Kano had the guts to tell a trench-coated guy who stood over eight feet tall and looked like an iguana that he was full of baloney. <laughs> What with his blather about the hidden sun and moon, about the boatsmen who would be waiting at his village on the East China Sea, about the island covered with fog and some master who didn't like to be disappointed. Besides, Kano was only staying in Hong Kong because he didn't have the money to go anywhere else. He had been deported from both Japan and the United States, and was wanted in 35 other countries. At this point, if he'd been invited by the Martians to help them conquer Venus, he'd have gone, as long as they'd have paid him in cash dollars. Still, he wished he could have come here with some of the regulars he'd been used to working with. Fei Hung, the drunken master from Korea. Connor, the swordsman from Scotland. Those were pros. Schneider and Moriarty were newcomers, small-time operators, who were friends with one of the leaders of the Black Dragon Society. They got in without having to prove themselves on a big solo job, and this was their first assignment. Kano was beginning to think that they were big-time losers. The other two men in the group were seasoned pros, though Kano felt that Jim Wu was a bit too seasoned for his taste. A former bodyguard from Beijing who used to work for Mao Zedong and drifted from job to job after the leader's death, Wu was now past retirement age. Though his enthusiasm was surprisingly high, his reflexes were halfway into the dumpster. Dumpster is capitalized in this book for some reason. It's a proper noun. Why is dumpster a proper noun? I don't know. If it weren't for his accuracy with throwing stars and his ability to roll a newspaper so tight that it made a passable knife, the fact that no one had been wanting to... The fact that no one had been run... Motherfucker. <laughs> I'm just looking stupid now because it's not the book's fault. Plus the fact that no one had been rushing to join Kano on this little adventure, Wu wouldn't have been there. Senman Joni was a different kettle of tea, a guy with no field experience and no physical skills. A former banker, a big-time desk jockey, Senny, was made the, Senny had made the mistake of joining the gold rush when greed became the operative word in the 1980s. He got seriously burned with insider trading and was only able to stay out of jail by agreeing to become an accountant for the Black Dragons. All he brought to this particular party was an ability to speak about 20 bajillion languages, eyeballs that were as sharp as shark's teeth, and the fact that he was willing to carry more than his share of the supplies they needed. Otherwise, he was Mr. Useless. And then there was Gilly. Kano had found her through a double agent, a Hong Kong cop who was on the payroll of the Chinese branch of the Black Dragon Society. The law dude said she was way cool, and he was right, though Kano had serious reservations about taking her on. He'd worked with a woman once before, which was one time too many. After he and Libby Liberator Hall had kidnapped a Bolivian newspaper man who was hounding some big-time money launderers in La Paz, Kano had tried to give her 40% of the payday and keep 60% for himself. Sort of like what he was doing now, only more generous because he liked the cute blonde. Hell, he'd figured. She was a 22-year-old kid who was just starting out, and he was a veteran. When he tried to stiff her for the 10% difference, he almost lost the use of his remaining original eye. He swore he'd never work with a lady again because they didn't reason with you when you had a disagreement. They just stuck a long-nailed thumb in your eye. <laughs> this is amazing. I love that Kano is like, I'll never work with a woman again. Why? Well, because I tried to fuck one over and she kicked my ass. <laughs> 
On the other hand, he had to admit that Libby had been one of the most trustworthy partners he'd ever had, and he had a feeling that Gilly here was the same. Kano certainly trusted her more than he trusted what that big lug had told him. Shuzhong Village, Mount Ifukube, names that hadn't been used in 10 centuries, and only that 8 foot tall guy's interpretations of other landmarks to guide them. Why didn't that stinking baby put some useful landmarks down here? Part of Kano thought he should have followed his initial instincts, to take the two million bucks and bought himself an island somewhere. But while the tall guy hadn't said much, Kano knew that one day old lizard ears would come out wading onto the surf and try to snap him like a wishbone. Better to do what he was paid to do, collect five million, pay each of the other black dragons two hundred thou, and use the other four mil that was left to buy a bigger island. So wait a minute. So, did we just learn that Kano, originally they were like, oh, a two million dollar job. And then they were like, well, they didn't know it was a three million dollar job. And now they're just like, oh, Kano will collect the five million dollars. <laughs> what a fucking asshole. He couldn't help but wonder what Gilly would do if she ever found out that he wasn't really being paid. Okay, we're going to take that again because I fucked it up. He couldn't help but wonder what Gilly would do if she ever found out what he was really being paid. Not that it mattered. She wouldn't. And even if she did, he could always go back to that Doc Ratwing in Munich and get a new ear or hand or whatever. He could still buy a nice island for three million. Boss! Senny had hurried up behind Kano and tapped him on the shoulder. Kano's hands shot to the twin pearl daggers he carried in sheaths on his belt. In the space of a heartbeat, the killer had turned and crossed them under the chin of the short, round-faced ex-banker. <laughs> no! No! Sen... Sen... We're gonna call him Senny. cried. Don't hurt me! I see something! He pointed a trembling finger toward the top of the rise. Up there! Kano twirled the knives and dropped them back into their sheaths as he turned. Squinting ahead into the setting sun, he saw something that made him smile. If the twisted, chipped tooth expression on the lower half of his face could be called a smile. Ah, fuck that up. Come on, he said, hurrying ahead. I smell good news. That's the end of chapter 12. We have, I think, I don't remember if I said we were going to do 9 through 13 or 9 through 14 here. But we're going to do 9 through 14. We're committing. We're committing to this big time and we're going to fucking make it happen. Chapter 13 starts. Goro, Shang Tsung said as he glided across the floor of the palace dining room. Has the boatman had any word from your man Kano? No, said the giant, his voice rumbling like a fortissimo bottom A on the piano. And Kano was not my man, Master Shang. He was a man, the only man. That voice, <coughs> ouch, really hurts my throat. Fuck. <laughs> I'm lightheaded now. This troubles me, said Shang Tsung as a hooded figure pulled out his ornate gold and ivory chair. The master of Mortal Kombat sat, his thin head shaking slowly from side to side. It has been five days! I expected it to take at least that long for them to find Kung Lao's ancestral village, Goro said. If in fact it still exists, he said he would send a messenger when he knew, for certain, that he had found it. The Sherpa said the village exists, Shang Tsung pointed out, though it now goes by some other name. The Sherpa, said Goro, would have said anything to save himself. I believe him, Shang Tsung said. The man was too stupid to lie. He rested his bony hands on the arms of the chair, the sleeves of his richly embroidered green and gold robe reaching nearly to the floor. At least five days to find the village. Oh, he sighed this. At least five days to find the village, Shang Tsung sighed. And then more days, perhaps, weeks of searching to find the mountain. After 1,500 years of searching and wondering, Goro, why are these last days so interminable? Because the prize is so near, Goro replied with his bowl fiddle voice. I don't know what bowl fiddle means. He fell into a large iron chair at the end of the long burl table. It was always... <laughs> it is always the way. In battle in the outworld, I never lamented the foe who escaped me by days, only the ones who eluded me by minutes. In love, 
I always missed my females more when I was about to see them than when I left them. You may be right, Shang Tsung said. Tell me again why Kano was the best man for this job. Why couldn't we get the man I wanted? Goro reached into the smaller of the two bamboo cages set before him, pulled out a small, struggling, gorny, uh, small, struggling horny toad and put the head in its mouth. He bit down. Because the man you wanted, Sub-Zero of the Lin Kuei Ninjas, was not available. I know that, Shang Tsung said, his reedy voice impatient. Why wasn't he available? Goro used a thick finger to push the rest of the horny toad into his mouth, and after shaking the cage to see what else was in there, he dug through a wriggling layer of garter snakes to pull out a newt. Because he killed an assassin by the name of Scorpion and went into hiding. No one knows where in China he is, not even other members of the Lin Kuei. Shang Tsung shook his head. But are you sure of this other man's pedigree, this Kano? Goro ate one of the snakes and nodded. When I couldn't find Sub-Zero, I learned that both the U.S. Special Forces and the benevolent White Lotus Society were looking for him. He needed the money, but more importantly, he needed a challenge. He reminded me of Kintaro, a leader in my army in the outworld. He would like to fight for pay, but if no pay is available, he likes to fight just the same. Goro's forked tongue played over his thin lips. These imported snakes... That sounded like Shang Tsung. These imported snakes are good. <laughs> and the society he belongs to, said Shang Tsung. The Black Dragon? Goro popped a second snake into his mouth, slurping the long green creature. Pushing away the cage of appetizers with his upper arms, he pulled the larger cage of entrees with his lower two limbs and threw back the lid. His red eyes went wide with anticipation as he studied the contents. His eyes settled on a Mexican beaded lizard, and he put his top right hand into the cage. They are a group that formed in Tokyo after what is called the Second World War, Goro said. Kano was only five years old when they found him, an orphan stealing from American soldiers and natives alike. He had the good fortune to steal from one of the members who admired his skills and took him in. And they say it's a cruel world, Shang Tsung said. He gazed toward the portico that, and at the hills that rolled toward the beach of his island. I don't know what the fucking portico is. <laughs> the view looked no different than it had 15 centuries before, when he and Goro had come here to toast the death of Kung Lao. Nor did he and Goro look any different. Instead of being held every year... Uh, Instead of being held every year, the Mortal Kombat tournaments were now held once every generation, in keeping with the different time frame that existed in the Outworld. Goro's unbroken string of triumphs had made it possible for the two of them to remain the same age they were the day Kung Lao's heart and soul had been ripped from his body and sent through the portal to Shao Kahn. If only there was some way to reclaim the lost fragments of my own soul, Shang Tsung thought. But he tried not to think like that. What had been lost was irre irretrievably lost, though the amulet would compensate a great deal for that if it could be located. We're going to pause real quick here and just say, like, we are finally getting some interesting shit. Kano is out traveling with a pack of goons. Shang Tsung and Goro have changed the frequency at which the Mortal Kombat tournaments are held. Shang Tsung didn't want to hire Kano. He wanted to hire Sub-Zero, who has gone into hiding because he killed Scorpion. Goro's walking around in a trench coat, hiring people to do shit. <laughs> That's a detail we can't forget. This is finally 115 pages in. Dare I say it's finally getting a little interesting. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but he will make it a better world, Goro, Shang Tsung said. With the souls you've collected through the years of victories in Mortal Kombat, we have nearly enough to open the Outworld portal and enable Shao Kahn to cross over. He gazed at the giant Shokanite as he gazed... Uh, he gazed at the giant Shokanite as he feasted on a live reptile. Through the venomous creature bit Goro before the giant managed to pull it in half. Not through, though. Though the venomous creature bit Goro before the giant managed to pull it in half, 
the Outworlder was immune to its poison. Once the Lord of Darkness has come here with his hundreds of hordes of demons, he will remake this sorry place. And when he does... This is really hurting my throat. <laughs> we will assert ourselves as well. You with the help... Uh, fuck, this is Shang Tsung talking, so I'm wasting this. Once the Lord of Darkness has come here with his hordes of demons and furies, he will remake this sorry place. And when he does, we will assert ourselves as well. You with the help of Kintaro and your army of Selinas. I with the amulet. Shang Tsung's dark eyes narrowed. Assuming this fool can find it. He'll find it, Goro said as a Gila monster he'd stuffed into his mouth hole. <laughs> Goro sat around a Gila monster he'd stuffed whole into his wide mouth. He knows that if he fails, he will be... There will be no hiding, sorry. Unlike the humans who seek him, I will find him. Shang Tsung raised the metal lid from his own plate, lifted his ivory chopsticks, and began picking at the chunks of broiled goat floating in a stew. He selected a small piece and chewed slowly while he thought back to the Sherpa, who had found the map in the mountains and who had sold it to one of the combatants in the most recent Mortal Kombat. An American who thought it would be a fetch. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we're almost done. <laughs> we're almost done. With this chapter, I mean. <laughs> An American who thought it would fetch a handsome price back in the United States and who refused to sell it to his host. The Americans remained still. Lay... In, the Americans' remains still lay in three spots on the beach where they landed when Goro flung them from here. They lay right beside the limbless torso of the Sherpa, who was found, brought here, and couldn't remember where he had discovered the map. The old yak, Shang Tsung thought. Too much time spent smoking herbs and not enough paying attention to what was going on around him. That kind of lifestyle would change when Shao Kahn ruled, with Shang Tsung and Goro at his side. There would be no lazing. People would be forced to build and study and serve. And if they didn't, they would be flayed alive and roasted. Shang Tsung had no appetite, but he forced himself to eat as he contemplated the future and waited for the boat that would bring Kano and the amulet with him. So that's the end of chapter, thir chapter 13. I can't even speak anymore. I need to have a drink so bad. <laughs> My head hurts. But we got one more chapter. I think I promised chapter 9 through 14. So we're just going to do it. We're going for it. <laughs> I hope I said 9 through 14. Or else this is a waste of time. As soon as he saw them, the shepherd left his herd and ran toward the village, his legs churning madly, arms flailing, voice shrill. Master Lao, Chin Chin wheezed. Master Lao, come quickly. Most of the villagers were in their homes, having a quiet dinner. And so they heard the boy who was always late bringing, bringing in his sleep. This night, unhappily so. What the fuck did that just say? Most of the villagers were in their homes having a quiet dinner. And so they heard the boy who was always late bringing in his sheep. This night, unhappily so. Whatever. <laughs> Moving forward. For if he hadn't been standing on the rise, the path of the travelers never would have crossed his. And the cruel-looking five men and one woman wouldn't have been on their way up the hill, toward the village, right now. Master Lao, please come! The young boy half ran, half stumbled over the hem of his pigskin coat as he made his way past the huts. Some of them wood, some of them straw, a few made of brick, toward the temple near the village square. As he reached the great bronze door of the ancient edifice, a powerfully built man with a long queue of black hair and a thin white robe stepped out. Though he wore an expression of concern, the man did not seem anxious. His light brown eyes didn't look as though they could ever show panic, or fear, or anything but the supernatural calm that was in them as he faced the boy. I don't know who this guy is, so I don't know what kind of voice to give him, so for now he's just going to have my voice. What is it, young Chin? the man asked, his voice soft but firm. Breathless and wide-eyed, the boy waved a stiff arm behind him. Strangers are coming! Priest Kung Lao! Evil-looking strangers are coming up our hill! Okay, so now we know it's Kung Lao. And if you're 
wondering, like, what the fuck? I thought Kung Lao died. That was the great Kung Lao, who was an ancestor of the sharp-hatted Kung Lao that you and I know so well. I'm going to use the same Kung Lao voice for him. <laughs> it isn't our hill, my son, the priest said. It belongs to whoever uses it. And looks can be misleading, he said, patting the youth on the shoulder. But come, let us go and greet the visitors and find your flock before they stray again. Shutting the door behind, shutting the door of the Temple of the Order of Light and motioning for people to return to their homes, the tall, barefoot priest followed the boy in the fast-fading light of dusk down the dirt road to the small village. Nearly a quarter of a mile of scrub and boulders lay between the edge of the village and the lip of the rise. Kung Lao and the boy met the newcomers halfway across it as the priest bowed, the priest bowing as Kano lumbered over. Welcome, said the high priest, bowing low. My name is Kung Lao. Kano looked the man up and down. Ain't you cold? He asked as he swatted himself with his arm. I'm freezing, and I got clothes under this jacket. There is a fire in the hearth at the temple, Kung Lao said, stretching a hand behind him, and warm broth in the cauldron. You are all invited to share both. A cauldron? Ah, shit. A cauldron, muttered Moriarty. I thought only witches had those. Shut up, Kano said from the side of his mouth. Where's your manners? Same place as your sense of direction, Moriarty grumbled. What did you say? Kano fired a look at him. He saw Gilda standing between them, her hand on the hilt of her blade, and his look softened. Priest, Gilda said, we accept your offer and thank you for your hospitality. If you lead the way, with pleasure, said Kung Lao. It's rare that we get visitors here, and I'm anxious to hear of the outside world. Rare is probably an understatement, Kano said, motioning his team forward as the priest turned and started toward the village. The leader of the gang snarled at Chin Chin, who yipped and rejoined Kung Lao, after having been transfixed on Kano's red eye. As they crossed the barren field, Seni hurried to catch up to Kung Lao. <sighs> Sir, said the... I don't know who the fuck is talking. Sir, said the hound-faced 40-year-old with thinning red hair. You just spoke English to the group. Yes, said Kung Lao. So, who the fuck... Whatever, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> yes, said Kung Lao. In addition to religion, I teach languages to the other people of my village. It enables them to dip into the lore and cultures of many races. You all speak it, don't you? We do, Senny said. But it's unusual to hear it spoken in the provinces here. Usually, one hears dialects of Cantonese or Mandarin. I speak all of those as well, of course, said Kung Lao. Languages are a passion of mine. Mine too, said the former accountant. Not mine, said Kano, inserting himself between the two men. Sonny, go to the back of the line before you start clucking in Tibetan or Mongolian or some crap like that. I want to talk to the father here. Ouch. These voices are taking a toll on me. <laughs> his expression dour, Senny fell back. After blowing into his cold hands, Kano turned his scruffy countenance toward their host. So, Kano said, what's the name of this little town of yours anyway? The current name is Wuhu, Kung Lao said. Current, said Kano. You mean it's had other names? Very many, said the priest, depending upon who was ruling the country at the time. When Mao was alive, we were, we were Desdungu. Before he came to power, our village was known as Tekamaki. Did you ever hear of a place called Shuzhang? Kano asked. I have, Kung Lao smiled. That was the name of our... That was the name our village went by when it was first founded, back in AD 300. Kano's sour face looked as though it had been splashed with sunshine. You're kidding. No, said Kung Lao. Jeez, Kano said, looking back at his team and giving them two thumbs up. We came here hoping to get directions to Chu Zhang, not to actually find the place. Well, Kung Lao said as they entered the village, you have actually found it. Might I ask why you were so interested in coming here? You might, Kano said. He yanked the map from his belt, handed it to Kung Lao. It's got to do with this cockamamie kind of map. I'm sorry, said Kung Lao, squinting at the goatskin. But it's rather dark out here. Oh, yeah. Kano snapped his fingers behind him. Torch, Senny. I forgot Kung Fu that not everybody's got infrared paper. <laughs> he called Kung Lao Kung Fu. Let's do that again. 
Torch Senny, I forgot. Kung Fu, that not everybody's got an infrared peeper. My throat hurts. Senny ran over with a small flashlight and Kano flicked it on. He turned the cone of the yellow light toward the map. See? Kano said, pointing with his pinky finger. This little splotch here is Chu Zhang. That's so that's us. Now over here, his grimy nail traced the course to the faded ink fingerprint, is where we're supposed to find a trinket of some kind. That's what the guy who hired me wants. What I need to know is exactly where this fingerprint is. Which mountain, I mean. Or maybe it's a cave. Who the hell knows, is what I'm saying. Kung Lao shook his head. It's a mystery to me. The range is large. There are many mountains and many more caves. But Master Lao, said the shepherd, looking. It says that this is Mount Ifukube. You know it, Kano asked. The shepherd looked from the map to Kano to Kung Lao. The master's face, usually soft and kind, was, unchar was uncharacteristically grim. Chin Chin's lower lip began to tremble. Uh, no, the shepherd said, taking several steps back. No, sir, I do not. Kano's red eye bored into the shepherd's frightened green ones. You're getting all hot in the cheeks and forehead. Why is that? I'm sick, the boy said. A fever. I think you're lying. No, the shepherd said. I was mistaken. He isn't lying, Kung Lao interrupted. Your map does say that this is Mount Ifukube, but no one knows which mountain that is. Its identity has been swallowed up by the sands of time. Very poetic, Kano said. He snapped his fingers again. Moriarty, front and center. The thugs stumbled over in the growing darkness. Yeah? Your choice. Take one of your two guns, put the barrel up the shepherd's nose, and send him into the village brains first. Sure thing, Moriarty said as he swung the M44 carbine from over his shoulder. Gilda stepped forward. Kano, think about what you're doing. We don't need them. We can find it ourselves. Put the blood back in your heart, lady, Kano said. This guy comes on like a big Joel Grey, Wilkerman kind of guy, then rolls up the red carpet. I want to know why. Because you've got a gun to the boy's head, Gilda said. Nah, Kano said. It's more than that. Anyway, whose side are you on? Kano's eyes shifted to Kung Lao. Well, Kung Fu, is that map starting to look just an eensy bit familiar? The priest looked at Chin Chin, whose eyes were a little were little moons, big and glowing, as he stood statue still. You have no concept of, at all of what you're doing, the priest said, his voice grave. Sure I do, you windbag, he said. We're about to decrease China's population by one sheep boy, unless you stop making like Rand McNally. <laughs> what a cut. Kung Lao's expression was grave. You've been sent by Shang Tsung, haven't you? That's privileged information, Kano said. Now, how about it, mister? You gonna help us, or do we have to paint the town red? Kain, uh, Kung Lao looked from one to the other of the thugs. I'll help you, he said. But I assure you, whatever you expect to get from Shang Tsung and his monster Goro, you'll be disappointed. Kano took the map from Kung Lao and folded it back under his belt. I'll worry about all that jazz. You just worry about finding some directions and packing us all some grub. You got some tour guiding to do. Dan Dance, thank you for watching Mortal Kombat Monday. This was another episode of me reading this fucking book. I don't want to read this book anymore. We're getting closer and closer to being done with me reading this book. If you have not lost your sanity yet, maybe you'll tune in next week to Mortal Kombat Monday. Um, I love you. I'll, you know, see you next week.